everybody, how's it going? I'm just checking in to do some live streaming. It's gonna be some Photoshop drawing today of uh, of the eye mostly, but I'm gonna be working on like some structural diagrams and things that are kind of work for a larger project. So I'll tell you all about it, by the way, while I'm doing it. I'll be chatting the whole way through. And if you have questions, you can always kind of ask me about it as well. I'm just gonna make sure that everything's sorted out and everything's working. Uh, last time I did a stream, I had a moment where I left the audio off. So now I'm like super insecure about whether or not that's gonna happen again. But real quick, let me just like switch over screen so you can see like the, the layout where we're gonna be drawing. All right, so here we are in the drawing space. I wanna real quick just mention something off the top that uh, is interesting for everybody. On my Patreon page starting on August 1st, there is gonna be a lesson from Patrick Burns. Uh, if you know him on IG, it's at Armstead, A-R-M-S-T-I-D. Really great follow, uh, amazing artist. And like I said, for two months only, that's gonna be available on my Patreon page. And then it's gonna go on to greener pastures, other platforms, other places. But I've got it for those two months. And it's a really cool video. You can check out the, uh, the preview that I already put out on, on YouTube uh, if you wanna find out more about it. But it's the same thing like baseline with all of my Patreon stuff. $10 subscription gets you all the goods and uh, that includes all my videos too. So you get Patrick's video, you get my video, and I'm gonna be doing a group critique for all the submissions that go along with Patrick's tutorial as well. So when you submit those on the community page of my Patreon page on August 20th, then on the 21st, I'm gonna do that uh, that group critique. So that's what's going on. And now I'm gonna to switch to the fun and chill part where I get to draw and uh, like chat with you, uh, you folks. So let me just get this off the screen. By the way, this is of course what we're gonna be drawing today, this, uh, this eye. And um, yeah, so uh, whatever, if you've got questions, you can just uh, chuck them in. There isn't really a specific topic for this stream. I, I usually try and do like a kind of specific topic, but like the reality is I got to tell you folks that like, whew, it's a, it's a lot of work to, to try to like keep track of kind of being on so many different platforms. And, um, like to be quite honest, uh, like even yesterday, um, you know, it's summer here in Norway and it actually gets like incredibly hot. And, uh, like my studio is situated on a side of the house where, where that's like where the the sun is hitting in the afternoon so like the the kind of 4 p.m sun which is you know like some of the hottest uh hottest stuff and i was actually i actually got kind of heat exhaustion i was knocked out for like probably 24 hours massive headache you know and um just totally like demotivated uh totally immobilized you know and um so like normally i like to plan things out and have like a whole kind of cohesive idea for what the stream is. But, uh, you know, the reality is like life just got on top of me a little bit today <laughs> or, or yesterday. So, um, so I'm just kind of like showing up today and considering it a victory just to, uh, <laughs> just to kind of be there. Um, but with this eye, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of separate it into, uh, into stages. So I'm going to do like a nice, you know, linear block in for it. Um, kind of showing as much as I can. Uh, and then I'm actually going to take it to like another layer, which <laughs> for those of you that like watch me, um, you know, like I don't do much with layers and stuff. I just like draw in Photoshop like it's like it's an analog world. Uh, but now I'm going to be I'm going to be acting like a Photoshop pro <laughs> and uh, and actually doing um, doing some layers on this. But so one of the questions that came in, by the way, like if you have questions, just chuck them into the comments and I'll, I'll be there to, to answer them. Um, MJ is asking how the book is going. This is actually part of, in a way, like projects that will lead to the, the, the book that I'm making. So I was trying to decide whether or not, like how to do the diagrammatic work in my book and like what the, the, the major thrust of the book is gonna be. Like what is it, what is it like technically about? to for me to like make this uh, this book that I'm making. And I wanted it to be of course like about my passion which is, you know, analog like in real life drawing. But at the same time, you know, I th I think actually that for the diagrams to be like best expressed, I think I actually should be making them digitally. Uh so there's going to be like a lot of digital work that's going to go into it. 
um, and a lot of um, kind of making diagrams in a very digital way. Uh, that's going to be yeah a big a big part of the book, um, just because I think there's just there's so much there's so much you can do, you know when you get into like that that world of like digital work because basically you can kind of create you know ten different layers of the same diagram you can you can you can say so much about the the, the subject that you're working on so that's that is in the pipeline but uh, you know it's going to be listen folks. 12 months would be optimistic uh, to actually consider, you know, like what's going to be, what's going to be possible to, to kind of create. Because of course, like I'm doing, I got a lot of um, irons in the fire, so to speak. You know, I've got this project with, uh, with Pat Burns that is like super exciting. Um, and by the way, like I filmed with him for four separate days. Uh, each day was like a new project. So what you're seeing, you know, what you're going to see on August 1st is like one day of that work. Um, and then I have two other painting demos and uh, one other drawing demo also. Um, and it kind of just runs the gamut from, you know, working with different palettes to like working with, um, what's the word, like uh, working with graphite and white chalk, working with, you know, just graphite alone. Anyway, so like there's a lot of like it goes deep. It's pretty cool, like uh, pretty cool stuff. Also, to see somebody like working that fast, like if you know me, and you know my work, you know, it ain't that fast. Um, but Patrick kind of uh, I think he specializes kind of in working quite quickly. Uh, but let's see, there's some more questions uh, coming in. So um, another one is how specific do you get with designing your halftone values in the beginning? How do you start with broad value shapes? like tiles or using fewer angle breaks to start of the design shape. You know, um, so for this question, you know, the question really, if you, you kind of boil it down is, is like, how do you, um, there are some questions out there in the world for which the answer is more something that, like it's so abstract to explain in words, like how halftones work. Uh, that that to to try to do it is a little bit, you know, maybe it'll be something I'll just talk about, like while I'm making half tones, like on this drawing, for instance, um, rather than than trying to maybe explain it in text. Um, yeah, because this is we're gonna go like surely like into values here and stuff, and um, uh, and I'll get to I'll definitely get to that stage where that's like a really kind of relevant topic right now, you know, I just want to get all of the kind of structural information uh, down in this drawing, but as accurate as I possibly can, you know, um, when, when you look at this, uh, this image as well, you can see like there's a lot of really pretty heavy shadow in it. And of course that, that represents a particular kind of challenge, you know, in, in that um, you don't have, like all of the the kind of form or structure information uh, easily kind of shown within the lights. So you have to, I'm not going to say like make guesswork, but you're going to rely a little bit on, on some of the things that you know. Um, also, it's like one of the few times you'll see me draw like a, like a much older person. Uh, normally my models are younger. That's just because, you know, um, most of the models I would use were people uh, that were, studying at the school where I taught, or they were like kind of professional models, uh, which also were, you know, um, they were living in, in New York, and uh, so kind of young people just like taking jobs just for a bit of cash, um, you know, in between other gigs or whatever. So it's generally like really young people that I was working with. Uh, but now, um, th well, this actually, to be totally transparent, is from a there were some images that I took um, of actually a good friend uh, of mine. Just thinking, you know, one day maybe I'd like to do a portrait of him. But then his his birthday was actually coming around and his wife commissioned me to uh, to actually make a painting. Or sorry, a, a drawing of him. Uh, so you might actually recognize this eye a little bit from uh, from that um, from that portrait. If you're if you're really keen, you've probably seen it on my Instagram or something. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, right. Let's see. 
There's some more uh, questions. Sam Reeves is asking, how often should we do master studies? You know, it's a cool question. I think when I was, I, I actually wish that when I was studying, I would have done more master studies. And I'll tell you why. When, um, when I was studying, like I didn't have like a good sketching ability, like, like the way that you see me kind of drawing in line now was, was not at all, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> not at all in line with, um, with like what my, my specialization was when I was studying. It was uh, much more, you know, visual, um, you know, which is to say it was much more about like shadow and light. It was also, this is the other part, it was also a lot slower, right? So, you know, drawing something rapidly was just like not a part of my visual vocabulary. Uh, there was no, there was nothing in me that, that, that did work under like three hours. <laughs> so the idea of, of sketching in a way, you know, was just not, I don't know, it wasn't, it just wasn't a part of what I did. And um, I bring that up because I think actually a lot of master studies you know, it's great to do like, like some nice, long, kind of protracted work, you know, that uh, that shows that you're really like taking your time and being diligent about what you're doing. Uh, and there's other times where actually your master study is probably like better done in a little bit of a, not in a hurry, but that you do it faster. Uh, the reason being is that you're not always looking uh, to learn you know, from your master study, like everything about what that artist did, you know, if you take Rembrandt as, as just as, as an example of somebody that we would do master studies of, it's not always, you know, his finish that like, I'm so curious about sometimes actually, it's just more, you know, the way that he handles the values in one of his pictures, for instance, you know, so for me, I don't, I don't always need to, um, to look at, the ultimate, like most finished work that's available from Rembrandt. Um, so when I was a student, what I wish I had done more of uh, was actually just, you know, just quicker studies of, uh, of, of great artworks, you know, just to, just to like get into my veins, you know, you know, some of the, uh, some of the vibe from those, uh, from those artists. And because I didn't have any way to like really, sketch all that well I didn't have I didn't have a way to do that and so that's kind of a bummer <laughs> frankly uh, like that kind of uh, that kind of sucks so I missed out on what would have been probably like some prime master study years in my um, in my life so I think that you you want to do them anytime that you find yourself like loving a work you know like I think of always of uh, Bastien Lepage's Joan of Arc. You know, that's one where, I mean, everything about it, <laughs> everything about it is absolutely magic, you know? And, um, and so why wouldn't I want to like take part in that and like try to understand a little bit where that's coming from? Uh, so how often should you do them? I don't know. How often do you like look at artworks and find artworks that you're, you know, enchanted by or amazed by, you know, like that's probably how often um it doesn't always have to be like whatever the greatest work in all of time is you know i bring up like rembrandt i bring up bastien lepage it's not that like those are the artists that um are the only ones you you can be copying or should be copying uh you know if you find yourself quite enchanted by you know like some modern works find out why it's like a good way to like i think about it like landscape painting right as much as I love like being outdoors and, uh, you know, hiking and stuff like that, the reality is if I'm, you know, out in a field or whatever, I'm going to probably spend like a maximum of, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, like would be incredibly long to just stand there like staring at, at a landscape around me, right? But if I'm doing a painting, if I'm making an oil painting, I'm going to spend like a minimum, an absolute minimum of like, you know, two, three hours totally engaged with the scene around me, 
right? So it's like a different, it's like to, to, to call like looking at something and making a study of something, like they're not even the same, they're not even in the same neighborhood, like with each other, these two activities. And like, that's how I kind of think of, of master study is that it's like this really intense, uh, sorry, like really intense uh, and intentional um, kind of focus just on this subject. All I want to see is this subject. You know, that's where, that's where it takes you to. And um, I don't think there's really any other activities that are going to, to kind of take you to that, that place of, of super intense focus. So when should you do them? I don't know. Like, I feel like you should do them as often as, um, as, uh, as you find yourself really kind of spellbound by a work, you know, find a way to make a study of it, you know, in a couple hours or something rather than, um, you know, only making work that, or only making studies where, you know, they would take you several hours or several days or whatever. Um, you know, cause it's really what we're doing is we're just focusing on watching something, focus on really looking at something, you know, quite, uh, quite intently. Now, that's what, that's what I kind of think of it. <laughs> it's my, uh, typical, like super long answer to a super short question. Um, let's see. S uh, Shubham Sharma says how to draw a line at a perfect inclination or angle. One of the things that you do a lot actually when you're working from from life, but you can kind of do as well working from a, a source image, is actually use the edge of your pencil. So like I'll close one eye and line up an angle with that part of um, of the source image and then like pull it over to my drawing and kind of compare the two like that. It's probably the best way to just compare angles. Keep your arm like straight, you know, and keep uh, keep the, the angle kind of held as, as tightly as you can. Uh, doing that can go a long way just to, um, yeah, to get you into that place where you have a relatively um, coherent angle to uh, to kind of follow through with. Yeah. By the way, I should also mention here that pretty soon I'm going to be doing some live streaming on Behance. I don't know if anybody knows that like platform, but it's, uh, it's Adobe, uh, the, the company that makes Photoshop. It's their, you know, I guess it's kind of like a portfolio platform, but they're like kind of transitioning it into like a live streaming platform as well. And um, so I'm going to be doing a few things over there. Those would be a little bit more scheduled as well. I'm going to like put out an actual, an actual schedule for when my live streams are going to happen. Um and you'll be able to uh, kind of follow along and watch. Um, I'm just kind of getting through some technical aspects of it right now, so uh, it's going to take probably a little while to iron out uh, just the technical stuff. But in the in the next uh, week or so, a couple weeks, something like that, um, that's when that's going to be starting to uh, to happen. Let's see. <laughs> let's see mj is asking you mentioned in the academy that they were mostly focused on visual 2d shape design and value shapes if so how did they teach the concept of form uh now when we say like the academy there's not of course not like one um i'm talking in particular about the uh the florence academy where where i studied and um yeah, their approach to form there was, um, in my opinion, was, I don't know, was, was there really like that much of an approach to form? I'm, I'm not honestly that sure. I mean, naturally, when you have like half tones and things, it, it, it will take you to a place where there's a conversation about form. But more than anything, they, they were kind of interested in how to flatten and abstract the subject, uh, which what that gives you is this usually like really strong sense of um, sense of like 2D design in the work. So uh, it gives you this advantage of giving you really great, you know, uh, consciousness of like a, a like a 2D design world. Um, but what can happen is you can. 
you know, as students will do, you can get a little bit carried away with like the simplicity of that. And that can take you to a place where all you can really do is flatten out and abstract and you, you lose a little bit that sense of, of realism that that form brings. Uh, so, yeah, in my experience, like, I, I feel like it was a place that, you know, could be, um, could be better addressed. But, you know, they have their curriculum, like every, every school exists because it like it stands for something, right? You know, what I mean, that's why things perpetuate through through time. Uh, it's not by coincidence it's because there's like a reason they have a reason for being you know in a way uh, you know standing against something is is almost as good as standing for something because you know it puts you into that position where you are um, you have a principle a bedrock a foundation or a philosophy and uh, the Florence Academy had that you know or has that um, they are there uh, to teach you in this particular way and um that's going to evolve uh, a lot of uh, really super solid 2D shape design. And, um, and so that's, that's where their strengths kind of are. If you're in so in like, again, if you're interested in form and things and like, that's where you want to be, you know, that's where, you know, I would, I would say like, oh, you should just consider like, well, you should always consider, you know, what are the, um, what are your options to study when you, when you want to study? You know, so there's a lot of different places you can go. Um, you know, even even if you want to study online, you know, you can probably get a whole education just just working online. Um, it's not even always necessary to to say go to one of those uh, schools if that's not you know within your your range of possibility. You know, um, I was uh, who was I talking to? See that you know, I was talking to one of my students actually. I do some like online teaching with. Um, uh, with some students and there was a guy in Miami and he was asking me about like, Oh, you know, I, I've saved up all this money and, um, I can go, you know, I wanted to, to check out these schools and, and see like which one I wanted to go to. So we were kind of talking about like advice about that and things. And, you know, I was saying that like, well, you know, what you really want to do is you just want to look at like, what is the school doing and does it align with your, with your aspirations, you know, like the, the work that you appreciate, the work that you enjoy, is do you see that mirrored in the, the work that they're producing at a, at a place like that? And, you know, if you're really into form and stuff, well, the, your answer is probably you don't go to a place that where form is not really the, the primary, you know, um, the primary focus of their, of their efforts, you know, um, and that's not a, uh, you know, I, if you know me, you know, I like to be balanced. This is not like a better or worse. This is a, this is a, you know, you're going to, you know, not all, not all realist training <laughs> is the same, you know, like it's kind of easy on the outside to think like, oh, this stuff, it kind of looks the same because it all looks like, you know, the natural world. Uh, but you know, there's some powerfully different, um, different things that are, that are expressed like through the philosophy of, uh, of a place. Um, and so anyway, long story short, um, I was saying that actually there's, um, a place that's actually opening back up. Uh, as far as I know, it was like kind of defunct for a while. Like it was not really in existence uh, at a certain point, but it's the, uh, the Lime Academy. I don't know if anybody's like heard of that one, but, uh, it's reopening with, um, a new director or, or new directors, um, or, which are colleagues I've worked with before. So uh, Amaya and, uh, and Jordan. Uh, Amaya Gurpide and Jordan Sokol. And uh, I know Eddie Rochat or Edmund Rochat is there. And um, yeah, so I think that's like, that school is going to be like a great synthesis of approaches, you know, um, uh, because I think that you'll have some teachers there that are, really like form based and form oriented and you'll have some teachers there that are really really super visual um and and kind of solving things in that way which yeah i think eventually probably that's the the synthesis uh, of those two is what i think is ideal uh, obviously 
you know, part of that is because like that's how I shaped my my world uh, uh, eventually is is to to try to combine together uh, the strengths of of each of these um, types of or ways of kind of looking at the world. You know, uh, I never wanted to be like limited by by a particular kind of training. You know, uh, if you listen to me a lot, probably this is like just put this on repeat or whatever. But, you know, I think that everybody's got like a little piece of the story, you know, something something that they understand really well and something that they do really well. Um, the idea that there's like one way is laughable. <laughs> you know, there's like so many different um, different ways to kind of train and study. And uh, if you're curious, you know, there, there's no end to to the amount of like cool different stuff that you can that you can learn uh, if you know kind of where to look. Anyway, on to the next question. Uh, Dwayne DeCock asks, "Hey Stephen, are there any universal rules about variation of local values in the face?" Uh, that's kind of cool. Um, I think that let's say that in general, right? Um, what if we kind of look at the, um, hmm, it, it kind of pertains to like the lighting situation, right? So if we look at the head, uh, let me just do a new layer here and um, I'll jump over. So if we look at, do, 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 if we look at the head, right, um, such as it is, like this is the head, of course, in, uh, in profile, we have the ear kind of roughly at the, um, uh, at the center. Uh, there are some things that you can understand given a particular lighting situation. Now, that's where it's kind of key because if you don't know the lighting situation uh, or it's uh, a very uncontrolled lighting situation, um, maybe you have some, uh, some difficulties actually in understanding particular things uh, about the head. Uh, so let's suppose here uh, then that we have a lighting situation which is uh, quite advantageous for portraiture, which is that that light kind of coming from the upper left hand side. Uh, now, in general, uh, what we know about the um, about the head uh, will indicate or, or it will dictate like certain things uh, about how the uh, the values will appear on particular planes. This is actually a lot of what I use when I'm when I'm working with students, you know, on on kind of critiquing their drawings and so on. Um, a lot of it is is not even me looking at at their source image or whatever model they were working from, uh, it's more like working with a conceptual model of the head. Uh, so, by the way, this is a little bit, a little bit too much skull on the back. <laughs> this is like my perfectionist uh, uh, vibe coming out. But, um, right, so what we'll expect to find uh, is that certain planes like the forehead and the top plane of the nose uh, will be getting like the highest key light Whereas there will be like secondary planes, uh, like say the front plane of the forehead and maybe the uh, top front plane of the uh, muzzle form that will be getting um, also like uh, quite light values. Whereas areas that are facing downward, like the, uh, let me just use a more exaggerated value, like the glabella and like the area below the, uh, the lips um, will also receive like that, that darker value. Uh, the chin as well, where it does turn up, will receive like a slightly light value, but that lighter value won't be maybe as light as what we have like at the top of the forehead, for instance. Uh, so this like particular set of like value orientation on those planes will tend to like, like dictate, you know, what the impression of, um, of light is going to be. So you have like a light forehead, you have like a slightly darker chin, you know, so that fall of light that goes from uh, lighter at the top uh, to darker at the bottom, right? That fall of light or, or, or degradation of light or whatever is very expected, very typical. Um, there are also things about like color. If I was working in color, maybe I'd get into, but you have like a general uh, yellowish, uh, yellow gray tone for the forehead, uh, sort of rosier in the kind of cheek quadrant, you know, and then like down around the muzzle form, uh, especially on guys, you get kind of slightly cooler temperatures. Um, but yeah, that's uh, something you can expect about the local values of particular areas. That's if the light is kind of coming from above. 
I mean, the same things can apply, like if you're going three quarter, if you're going another direction or, or whatever, but uh, like in general, uh, that's one you can expect. Let's see, Jamie is asking, do you find that you're more efficient or expedient when filming as you work? Does it give an imaginary deadline, so to speak? No, <laughs> I'm way slower. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm like frustratingly slow when I'm, when I'm filming stuff or when I'm live streaming. Uh, you know, it's, it's honestly like half the pace uh, that, I, that I am like when I'm working normally. Um, you know, yeah, so it's, you know, I look at it and it's just kind of like a necessity. I mean, if you're going to communicate this stuff, you need to be, you know, it needs to be visual. You need to be able to kind of, you know, see and look at what you're doing. Um, so it's a necessary thing for me to to be filming and to, to be demoing like this. Uh, but yeah, wow, it takes, it takes so much longer um, uh, to work in this way than it does uh, when I'm just working on my own. <laughs> Also, you know, there's this this other thing, which is uh, a factor that probably you would never know about if I if I didn't say anything about it. But you know, in a way, I actually kind of mentioned this in one of the uh, things I posted on on Patreon, which is called a an unguided paint along. And this was essentially like you know, I I just had some projects that I was working on, and naturally in my studio, like I have a whole kind of film setup that's just there perpetually. Like I don't take it down every time I, I finish filming. So it's kind of natural that when I work, I just kind of turn the camera on and, and go because why not? It's there, right? So some of this footage I, I thought was like kind of really interesting and I wanted to share, but you know, there was, um, there's an effect like that occurs, I think when I'm doing demonstration work and it is that I tend to favor or work more in a kind of very rational way. Whereas, you know, and, and I said this, I think, in the post, not all choices that you take when you're painting are going to be rational choices. Sometimes you kind of go with a feeling, you know. So, I mean, you've been spending all this time sort of working on and like orchestrating your, your sense of like taste and your sense of like focus and all these things. And sometimes you just kind of shut off that frontal lobe and you just start like going on your, your instinct. Um, and so I needed to kind of announce that because some of the things that I would do, you know, were very like exper experimental, you know, like stuff that I don't, I don't know if it's gonna pull off. Maybe I try something out and it's like horrible. <laughs> I need to like totally redo it. And, um, and so I wanted a place that I could kind of show that that aspect of um, yeah that aspect of uh, uh, of work where yeah you don't always like have an answer. There's there's this sense like kind of when you're when you're demoing as much as I demo that you you always do things for which there's like a good explicable like rational reason, and um, that's great for teaching. You know I believe that. That's really like how teaching has to be <laughs> um, because otherwise maybe we're just all we're doing is we're just making a um, uh, yeah, like you can make a cool demo. That's not really like super educational. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the point I want to make is that uh, it freed me a little bit from this feeling of like having to know all the time, like having to be uh, super aware all the time of of like why I'm doing something um, and let me kind of get into that uh, that subconscious zone where a lot of kind of creativity takes place. Yeah, so no, it doesn't speed me up at all. Uh, let's see some questions and comments coming in. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Seven, seventh Sun... Seventh Son One says, "So, do you paint landscapes? Uh, if so, I'd love to see it live." Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's a place for me to do like a kind of live stream of some like landscape sketching or something. Uh, it's something that like I, I enjoy kind of playing with. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't, I'm not like a serious landscape painter by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you know, so there is that that potential of like I just I just kind of set up and I do some stuff and. Uh, 
yeah, and sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's tragic, uh, but you know, I just keep going because it's because uh, it's kind of fun. Um, so yeah, maybe I don't know if there's enough enough people that want to see um, me doing like a landscape sketch. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll do one um, on YouTube. Let's see. <laughs> I'm skeptical that enough people want to see me do it, though. <laughs> frankly, um, but uh, I don't know. Enough of you like to see me drawing eyes, so maybe there's uh, there's people out there that are that are curious enough. By the way, so what I'm doing with this now is I'm just kind of like trying to lay in the the, the major value planes and. Um, you know, the major kind of shadow and light dynamic so that I can kind of move on uh, to the next stages. I'm going to kind of break this apart into like uh, some phases where I work more on uh, structure and then I work more on like detail. So like towards the end of the stream, I'll, I'll get into maybe some smaller brushes and stuff and, and some slightly more detailed work. You know, it's funny that I think that like, I feel like the detail work is obviously it's what is really fun to watch, you know, and it's what's really maybe attractive for uh, for people in a way. But it, like, it has to you have to do a lot of stuff before that detail work is super kind of relevant to to your cause, you know, to what you got to get done. So I'm just working on the, the 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 structure now, which is, by the way, if you're drawing along, and and I mean that's why I put up these. Um, that's why I put up these source images. If you're drawing along, uh, yeah, try and like keep the pace too. Like try and try and stick with me in terms of, you know, when I'm working on structure, you know, stay working on structure. If I'm like kind of progressing into into smaller brushes and detail, you know, follow uh, follow along with them. Like also notice I'm working a lot from the the middle out in terms of value. Uh, so I, I, I tend to start with like a really, uh, really lower key value. So, um, uh, or sorry, like a higher key value. So like a lighter value uh, and then proceed from there more into a, a place where I have like stronger, stronger contrast. Like I'm just now getting some of the, uh, like the darker darks in the, in the eye as well. Let's see. <laughs> Some questions and comments coming in. Um, Paul is saying, Hi, Stephen, what is your go-to ice cream store in Florence? Listen, if you are in Florence, uh, you are fortunate enough to be in a really, really fantastic place uh, for which there are so many great uh, gelato places. Um my favorite is one uh, right by uh, the Duomo. Um, it's a little bit hard to find because the, the central like cathedral, the Duomo in Florence, uh, there's like a lot of little streets, um, especially just to the, if you're looking at the facade of it, to like the left, or sorry, to the, the right of the facade. It's like a lot of like little uh, kind of alleyway streets and things, um, all of which are like filled with kind of interesting stuff. But um, one of the places you'll find there is a gelateria called Grom, G-R-O-M. And, uh, you know, all of their, all of their stuff, like all their gelato is like, it comes from the stuff that it's supposed to take. Like, it's all like totally legit, like natural flavors and, uh, like freshly made like in-house all the time. It's the, it's the best gelato in Florence, as far as I'm concerned, if you have a competing gelateria. I would love to hear it. Tell me about it. And um, I mean, there's some other ones that are good, by the way. Like, you know, this it's true about Florence that you can't like throw a rock without hitting like a really great restaurant. Uh, so this, I mean, it's pretty similar with gelaterias. Like you, you, you can find so many good ones. Uh, there was one um, when I lived over by the uh, Fortezza di Basso, uh, which is a little bit um, outside the historic center. I uh, lived on a street called uh, Via Lambroschini. And it was uh, right near a gelateria called uh, Gelateria di Medici, which, of course, like everything in Florence, is kind of like the Medici, like the Medici's kind of <laughs> built that city. 
Uh, so, anyway, but they took that uh, that name, and the gelato there. I think. I mean, yes, it was good. It was also like right by uh, our apartment, so we had cause to be there very frequently. <laughs> Too frequently. Uh, but I mean, when you're in Florence, you eat gelato. That's what you do, especially in the summertime. Oh my goodness, you got to stay cool if you're in Florence. Somebody uh, with a name that is in a script that unfortunately I can't read, uh, but they're asking, is the artistic life lonely? What do you do to counteract it? Well, you start by probably marrying an artist. <laughs> uh, I did. She's um, someone who uh, I went to school with, someone who I studied with, and um, obviously she gets the, uh, the trials of uh, kind of being an artist and all this stuff that kind of goes along with it that's tough. I mean, you know, it can be uh, a life where, you know, strangely enough, as much as it seems like artists get patted on the back so often for their work, you know, sometimes it can feel also like a very thankless job. You know, you can feel like you're just working and working in the in the dark. Um, I know a lot of people will experience that and that's a tough thing to um, that's a tough thing to to push through with because uh, yeah, like you need to you need to make a living with what you're doing because if not, you, as you grow older, like you you won't have the 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 time to do it. Like this is certainly you know what I discover is that well, I mean I've known it for forever is that um, yeah you you have to you have to find a way to earn. Uh, I think to be an artist, uh, it's contrary to maybe the romantic notions that you just want to do this stuff because it's cool and uh, just because you want to make great work. But, uh, you know, everybody is going to have, you know, those responsibilities in their life. Everybody's going to have, you know, a lot of you out there where you'll have kids, um, you know, even if you don't, you have yourself and maybe your partner and and you have to to have your your life there also. Um, you have to pay to to be there. Uh, so, yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, so, you know, being with somebody that, that I think knows that very well and, and understands, like, that part of the journey uh, obviously is really, um, it's really helpful because, yeah, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't always give back in proportion to what you give to it. You know, like, you can be working so hard and uh and it feels like kind of nothing comes out of it uh, i've i've totally been believe me believe me when i tell you i've been there and back again uh over and over and over i mean yeah i still you know feel that way some day sometimes now i mean as as lucky as i am to be able to to do as much of of what i do um uh, and to have so many people be interested in listening to me and and following and uh, and so on um still you know, there's times where you feel like, man, you know, like I'm just, I'm really trying to do this thing the right way. And it just, you know, sometimes it just doesn't feel like it's giving, giving back the effort that you put into it. Um, but that's, you know, that's life. And when you have someone that, that understands that it's a lot easier to, uh, uh, to deal with that kind of, you know, on a day to day basis. I mean, without, without that, without Cornelia, I don't know. I, I probably would have uh, had a lot more stress in my life if not for uh, if not for her. So I say, <laughs> possible, uh, you know, go to a place where there's enough of us, and find a good one <laughs> to spend your life with. You know, um, because in the end, like they, they're gonna get, they're gonna get what you're going through, and that's it's important. It's not. It's not a small thing to have somebody that kind of understands what your professional kind of trials are about. Yeah. Let's see. Angel says, I would like to draw comics. Do you think it's appropriate to follow an academic method to learn to draw? Or is it just for an artistic path? I don't know. I mean, obviously, since I'm not uh, an artist who's done comic work, uh, I can't really speak to that with a lot of uh, a lot of advice that that comes from experience. Um, but you know, 
Sometimes uh, it's not always about taking the kind of fastest, uh, straightest route to a thing. I mean, you know, something that I kind of believe in is that, you know, crossing kind of boundaries is a great way to, uh, to, to kind of have a fresh take on something, you know? Uh, like there's a guy, oh man, I'm not going to remember the name. There's a fantastic, uh, really, 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 really super epic, you know, digital concept designer guy. Um, wow, I really don't remember his name. Uh, but trained totally like uh, traditional and like it's probably his biggest inspiration in his work, you know, is is Sargent. And you, you see that actually in his digital paintings. Um, there's this particular kind of aesthetic that that is inside them this uh this kind of big picture vibe um this simplicity and economy in his shape design uh that i, I don't think he would have if he had just only studied one um uh, one way of working so you know for me i think that if you have like an inclination towards this kind of work then i say take it go and uh and see kind of where where it leads you because you probably like, you know, think that you know what you want to do. I mean, I imagine probably you say you want to be a, a comic artist. So, so for you, that's, that's your kind of destination. I wonder if, um, you know, if you go out in the world and you experience some things, maybe you find, maybe you find that that is truly like exactly what you want with no kind of, um, uh, change in it uh, but maybe you find something different maybe you find out that that actually you like traditional work yeah but you don't know if you don't try so that you're here like watching me do this and I mean like most of my audience is an audience for analog work which I understand like when I work digitally <laughs> you know some people that follow me are like what are you doing man like you're supposed to be always analog I mean I get as well I don't get as much maybe about working digitally as I get from working analog but you know, there's an aspect of it that I, I embrace and that I really like and uh, that I think influences my work in a positive way. So I do it because it does something for me, you know, and I think that, that that's valid. Like if it does something for me, I feel like for sure it's going to do something for the people that, that, that follow me that have like a similar interest. So if you're wondering like, why does this analog guy, like why is he here on Photoshop, um, you know, making digital work? I mean, that's why, because I kind of believe in like kind of cross pollination, you know, I believe that that that's interesting and vital and kind of cool. <laughs> By the way, like what also for just for starters as well, like talking about uh, digital v analog, you know, um, in terms of like what's happening today, you know, I think that digital artists have like lapped you know like when, when you're in a race and someone goes <laughs> like someone is on the the middle of their second lap and you're on the middle of your first um they have like lapped analog artists in terms of like composition uh, and it's not in my eyes it's not particularly close um everybody can have a view about it for sure uh but this is my opinion that that because of the nature of like the medium that they use they just have this opportunity to like make the kinds of changes in manufacture that really benefit compositional study, which is, you know, and, and if you're a digital painter, like you already know this stuff, like this is already like, you, this is like day one digital painter stuff, but you know, you can take your entire composition and just flip it and go, oh, maybe it actually works, but a little bit better this way. You can take the, the, the focal area of your composition, pull it, you know, a little bit to the right, and then you have like a whole different like kind of focal arrangement. For an analog artist to experiment that way, I mean, obviously it's possible, but it is far more time consuming. So these uh, folks are out there uh, you know, experimenting, failing and failing and failing forward, forward, forward. And it's that that classic story of the uh, the pottery class. <laughs> and it is that that, you know, if you sit around trying to theorize the one perfect, you know, uh, pot to 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 throw uh, or you take that time and instead of like theorizing about throwing pots, you're actually there like making a hundred 
uh, different, um, you know, clay pots, naturally the person that has made 100 clay pots is going to be failing and learning from those failures uh, and reaping the benefits of that. And therefore, I think working, uh, frankly, like um, at a higher level than, uh, than the person who's uh, hanging around, kind of thinking about it and thinking about it. Um, again, you know, I'm, I'm open-minded about this stuff. Uh, if you have like another opinion about it, I think that's totally cool. Um, but for people studying composition, you know, digital tools can be super powerful. Let's see. Uh, some questions coming in. Hang on, hang on. I got to scroll back and find them. Uh, Abhinav Bardwaj says, when I stretch my paper, its fiber starts to pluck out and the surface becomes unpleasant. Am I doing something wrong? It sounds like you might be watering the paper a little bit too much. You know, if the, if the, if the surface gets too moist, what can happen is that you'll, you can end up, you can end up like undoing the glue of the paper. And um, eventually what's going to happen is, uh, is that like the paper itself can like fall apart. Also, by the way, if you're using a paper that's not of a particularly great quality, um, you can also find yourself in that situation where um, maybe the the glue that's in the paper is not, not enough. Uh, and you're, like I said, kind of breaking up that, uh, that glue a little bit too much. Um, which is, is not good. So that's what it sounds like to me uh, might be going wrong. So I try just soaking the paper a little bit less than, um, than maybe what you are, uh, what you're doing now. Yeah. And if that's not it, you know, um, if you're still having trouble, like I'm kind of curious as to what's happening. So let me know. Uh, let me know if that's something already, by the way, that you're already thinking about, or if that's something you already tried. Um, and maybe we can get to the, uh, get to the bottom of it. Or if anybody else has had that experience also, you know, let me know. Um, <laughs> I have enough. Bardwaj is asking, do you feel while looking at a drawing that how exceptional you were when you were doing it? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, I feel a pride in my work for sure. You know, like I'm, I know I'm good at stuff. And so, uh, I look at what I do and I think sometimes, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, but probably like, like most of you out there, um, I think that like most people just in general, uh, we tend to remember, and this is something that, uh, you actually, you'll hear from like the place I heard this was like, a a coach of, um, American football team. He was saying like, at a certain point you remember the losses more than you remember the wins. And like, that's, uh, I think that, that probably a lot of us can kind of relate to that where, you know, those losses sting a little bit more, the, the, you know, the memory of them stays a little bit longer than what the, um, the high of a, of a, a good experience does, you know, and, um, it's another like tough part of, I talked about the challenges like you face as an artist and stuff. Like one of them is, you know, that, that feeling of like, whew, I'm working really hard and nothing's happening. <laughs> that's tough it's, it's really difficult uh, and I laugh about it but it's you know like you know, laughter is just like a, a coping mechanism you know it's just, uh, it's just something we do to try and you know push back a little bit on that that feeling of uh, anxiety that's caused by something but for sure um, for sure you know I, I definitely have that anxiety and uh, yeah it's pretty universal stuff, you know, in a way, like a lot of the insecurities that we have, uh, you know, they're super, just, they're super typical, you know? Um, and, you know, a lot of people maybe are out there looking for like the, the magic bullet, you know, that's going to satisfy, you know, those, those feelings, but probably it's just, you know, coping and moving on, <laughs> you know, it's like you realize, this, uh, you know, this is not a, a productive feeling, you know, um, uh, you know, feeling bad about your work. And if you're going to be productive, you got to like let some of that go, um, which 
that doesn't mean it's like it happens, but like knowing that that's what has to happen. Um, you know, I find that that helpful anyway, you know, that, um, that knowing I've got to, I've got to get rid of this because it is doing the total opposite of what I need to be doing, which is being productive, you know, and actually, you know, someone asked earlier about like, whether working on film uh, has like, helped me be more, more like faster or something. It definitely does not help me be faster. However, one thing it does do uh, is ensure that like when I'm working on a project, my, my rate of finishing those projects uh, has dramatically increased. Like, you know, when you're working on film, you're working on a tutorial, like there is no, there is no version of it that doesn't get finished. Like you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. You know, you gotta wrap it up. Uh, and, uh, and so that's a big motivator for me as well. Like when working on film is that, you know, I gotta make sure that I, that I bring this thing home, you know? So, so that's also where you like start to take, I think some maybe more wise choices about like what to do when, you know, um, like what kind of, uh, and this is interesting for, for art students too, is like what, what kind of process is going to most frequently lead you to the result that you're looking for? Um, you know, that uh, is a thing to, to discover because, again, for a professional, it's not, about, it's not about having one good drawing, one good painting or whatever. You know, it's, it's about consistently being able to produce the effect that you're looking to produce, you know, so that, you know, uh, Cornelius always talking about, like, you know, when people say happy accidents, you know, this is like, like, she just goes, like, happy accidents. What do you mean happy accidents? Like, really, there's, there's not really any accidents about, about painting and drawing, like, you know, uh, representationally. Like, if you made it happen, you know, then you made it happen. Like, take credit for it. Like, it's, it's you that did it. Um, and so, like, for me, it's, it's also just a matter of, uh, of productivity. Like, if, I'm, if I can't reproduce the result, then it's kind of, um, I, I mean, it, it can be worth doing, but maybe it's not, like, the most productive thing that, that, that I could be doing because uh, I can, like, you know, maybe I can never do it again in that, in that way. So that's not, uh, yeah, it's professional. It's not something that I, I tend to look for. I tend to to look for repeatable results. And that comes down to like what materials you'll use. There's a lot of, a lot of things that uh, kind of relate to that. Um, yeah, that, that necessity. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I'm kind of getting lost in my drawing a little bit, which maybe is a kind of a good thing. Um, I just want to lay in some kind of broad strokes of, uh, value here. By the way, I'm just using like one brush for all this stuff. It's, uh, it's just one of the generic, like pencil brushes. It's like a, I don't know. It's probably like, I think it's meant to like, look like a bit like a pencil, um, on, on Photoshop, uh, which is probably why I chose it just because it's the. Yeah, I don't need a lot of like frills, you know, I'm just more, and I talk about this a lot too, like, what's the difference between like drawing and, and design, right? Like, why do I, why would I say like design when talking about something? Um, like, why is that kind of relevant? Um, why wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't we just use the conventional, yeah, you know, the, the, the word drawing. I think design kind of refers to a whole host of like choices that you're taking. And I think that's why I favor it, um, because to to be drawing is to say that that yeah, like anything you do, like oh, I'm just putting stuff on the paper, like that's or or on the on the screen in this case, like that's drawing. But I think when you're when you're designing something, when you're taking design choices, it means that you're kind of working on different levels. You know, like I'm not only thinking about what what the eye looks like. I'm thinking about what is the coolest version of this eye? Like, what is the, the version of this eye that I think is, uh, no pun intended, is ideal? You know, like, how does it, you know, how do you communicate form in the simplest way 
you know, that's like, that's a design question. I don't think that's like, I mean, yeah, sure. Like you can say in one way, yeah, like technically if it's about drawing, it's all drawing, but um, coming from, <laughs> frankly, coming from academia, uh, we like to kind of parse things out and to um, uh, to search for maybe like a more true or holistically true kind of meaning in something. Um, and that that is like all the reasons why I choose to say design rather than uh, than just drawing. Not that that's bad. I mean, you can say just drawing. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Let's see, Sam Reeves says, uh, when I practice cross-hatching, I can make small areas look even, but larger projects look messy. How can I get away from that haphazard quilt look? Yeah, I think some of that will have to do with just, uh, you know, frankly, just like getting better at cross-hatching. I think that the um, initially, uh, you know, there's, hmm. I, well, it's, I don't want to just say, oh, we'll do more of it. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's that's an obvious one. Uh, if you want to get better at it, doing more of it will be um, uh, will be the, the pathway to that occurring. Um, but that being said, uh, I think that, you know, there are projects where you can better practice your technique. And I think that focusing on some of those uh, maybe is an interesting way to do it. Like, you know, one of the projects uh, that I have on, on Patreon is uh, the Conceptual Sphere project, which uh, eventually I think is, you know, is due for an update. I might update that project um, if I have time coming up. Um, but the thing about that is, it's like it's a forum for also practicing exactly what you're talking about, right? Like it's not, it's not just a place to, uh, uh, to draw a sphere like we're talking about practicing technique also um and that can be uh yeah that can be like a super useful way to kind of uh sharpen your abilities but it is something where it's like you know like unless the you know unless you're at the gym daily you know no amount of there's no like idea that's going to help you do it you know like cross hatching is a technique and like any technique, the, the more proficient you become at using it, like the, you know, the better it's going to, the better it's going to look. Um, so I think that's what you have to look uh, forward to is just uh, spending some more time with it and um, being comfortable with the fact that, that, yeah, maybe right now this is, you know, it could look better, but, um, but with time, eventually like it will look better. Yeah. So just take it slow, take it easy. You know, and uh, eventually it will it will come to you. You know, you don't um, like technique as well. You know, you don't really have to chase after technique too much. You know, I think it's it is something that is chased after a lot um, uh, because it's something that is admired a lot. I think that, you know, we look at artists that we really like and go, wow, they have a great technique. I want to have a great technique or I want to be a great artist. So so I need that that technique. And probably, honestly, you're you're right. I mean, commercially successful artists in general, you know, they're probably going to have like a good technique. Uh, that's not across the board. I mean, somebody out there, I'm sure, like tell me about the the artist that they know that is commercially successful and has a terrible technique. I'd be happy to hear about it. Um, but like in general, you know, they're going to have like a nice a nice technique, and that's that's that kind of thing where you need to be like at one with your tools you know um like you know if you're a sushi chef you know what i mean like you can't be you know you need to be able to 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 slice uh probably never with your eyes closed but you need to be you know what i mean like you need to be that knife needs to be like a part of you you know it needs to be uh perfectly under control like making exactly only the cuts that you want to make um nothing more nothing less you know, that's the, uh, the necessary ideal, right, in that, in that situation. Um, and it's a little bit the same, like, with drawing and painting. It's like the, the, the pencil or the brush, they got to be, like, a part of you, you know. They got to, you got to be um, not even usually, like, thinking about the, the pencil, you know. Um, 
Uh, there's some sports metaphors there that I'll, I'll spare all of you because I know I'm the only sports fan. Of all the artists that I know, I'm like the only one that cares anything about sports. Um, <laughs> it's like the curse of, uh, like I love, um, uh, I really love European football, right? So um, I was introduced to Barcelona many years ago by uh, some friends of mine in, in Gothenburg and I really got the bug for, for watching football and uh, it's the great curse that like all the people that I meet, all the Europeans that I meet, they're all artists. And so they all like will roll their eyes about, <laughs> about uh, like foot, football for sure. Um, but you know, really in general, most things sports related. So uh, I have all these, I'm sitting on all these great sports metaphors, but I can't use any of them. <laughs> That's my, I guess that's my uh, cross to bear. Huh? Let's see, Paul Contreras Pina says, how do you think Sargent approached his method of painting? I know he knew watercolor. Did he apply watercolor technique in oil? I uh, don't know if you know watercolor. Do you have a, uh, have you studied Sargent at some point? Yeah, actually, uh, oddly enough that you mentioned it, Paul, uh, right now on my Patreon, uh, there is part one already of my master copy of uh, John Singer Sargent's Lady Agnew of Lochnaw, uh, which is probably one of his uh, uh, most famous portraits. And in that, in that tutorial uh, so far, uh, all we've done so far is to go through um, by just making a preparatory drawing underneath. Now, Sargent wouldn't have done that. Uh, he would have painted uh, quite directly on the canvas, um, letting the, the design and everything uh, happen in one kind of fluid uh, act, uh, maybe over uh, several layers, but, um, but always uh, conceived of kind of together. Uh, but being that we're students, like we're kind of studying Sargent, um, I thought it would be appropriate actually to do a, a little drawing block in uh, because essentially we just don't want to get, you know, like uh, uh, we don't want to get caught, um, you know, wanting to study the colors and values, but having a design that is insufficient to support that. Uh, meaning, right, you realize at a certain point in your painting, oh, the, the, the drawing in my painting is so bad uh, that it's uh, actually subverting the, uh, the painting that's supposed to be going on. Uh, that's why we're, we're doing that and that's what I wanted to avoid by doing that so that um, uh, people that are, are studying can, uh, like I said, just get a better base to kind of build on top of. Um, now, there are some things out there already about uh, the way that Sargent worked, so this is not, you know, going to be news to anybody, but um, working from those middle values out uh, is definitely something that uh, his teacher, Carlos Duran, would have um, uh, strongly been in favor of and uh, something Sargent is known to have done. Uh, so in that way, maybe it doesn't uh, uh, support exactly how you'd work in watercolor, but I tend to work actually in watercolor that way where uh, I'll work with the, uh, the mid-tones and mid-tones and mid-tones um, and then only uh, towards the very end uh, will I get into the, uh, the darkest values that are, that are going to be present there. Uh, so it, it tends to mirror a little bit how how I work with watercolor. Um, I, I mean, but I know, here's the thing too. Like I never I never actually studied watercolor, and so I've been asked before, like, oh, you should do something with watercolor. You should do uh, like a watercolor lesson, and it's like I'm not I'm not trained in it enough to to say like, oh, you should paint watercolor this way or or not. Yeah, I'm uh, what you would call a dilettante. Uh, I quite enjoy watercolor. Uh, I do it because uh, it's fun, um, because it's uh, engaging and enjoyable, um, and not for any other reason. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's see if there's any more uh, questions coming in. Yeah. Lukeman is asking what brush I'm using. It's, um, I, I don't even know what it's called, honestly. It's just some generic uh, 
uh, it's like something like uh, like happy pencil or <laughs> this really whatever like the first brush that came up on Photoshop like that's the one that I use um, and I, I do so kind of intentionally in that um, you know I don't I don't uh, I mean there's other like softer brushes that I use sometimes when I'm demoing but or like like working with students a lot of my one-on-one -on -one sessions like I do obviously on Photoshop because uh, it allows you to um, like I can screen share like live drawing with a student uh, so so naturally that's that's an asset uh, that that I want to use uh, sorry I was just looking at some little drawing elements that I wanted to communicate here this is this is where like uh, yeah uh, work, somebody asked earlier about like do you work faster on camera <sighs> no like almost like I, I get distracted you know of course like naturally i get distracted um by my drawing brain not not communicating with my painting brain <laughs> or or vice versa or one, one or the other but uh they they get in each other's way and like one will kind of stumble over the other a bit uh, maybe that's the, the 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 jeopardy that actually makes these live sessions uh fun is that uh that knowledge that it can all go uh, go bad if I um, if I'm not able to focus. So it's like watching a tightrope walking. You know, you can't. You don't want the guy to fall. But like that's part of the part of the show is that 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 he or she they could fall. You know. <laughs> I yeah. I wonder. I don't know. Probably you guys want me to do a great job. That's what I'd imagine. Um, but like I said, some of the some of the fun is maybe in the, the Jeopardy as well. So let's see. Uh, Vasantha Kumar is asking your advice to 17 year olds to become a successful artist. Um, think, uh, you know, take the long view and practice hard skills um, by hard skills i mean things like uh, drawing uh, things like anatomy things like you know color theory um, learn the 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 principles of drawing because those will really never go out of style um, and if you have them nobody can like nobody can take that away nobody can say like oh that's not that's not useful. It's always useful. So uh, practice the hard skills and um, understand that that those skills eventually will lead you to a place where you will make very expressive work. Uh, but the expressive work, honestly, it doesn't it doesn't come at the beginning. That's a hard thing because probably all of society is like telling you something different. You know, um, the world is telling you that. To be an artist, all you need to do is just like express yourself or express your, your feelings on a canvas. And I mean, hey, you know, expression is obviously the a big part of the end goal of artwork or being an artist. But it doesn't it doesn't like happen on the day that you start. Like it's it's so far in the future. Um, I think that by well, hmm. Here's, an, here's a hot take, right? I think that, that a, a big part of why like a lot of schools will like really kind of favor that idea uh, is actually because it is convenient for them in that if they're showing student work that is like great and expressive, then it, it seems like their education is fantastic. Um, I think that probably like as an artist, probably you should be producing your best work, like certainly after you've left the the school that you're you're studying at, right? You should be focused on probably like learning the the craft early on, and then later on, you know, uh, uh, making expressive work. But for schools, you know, if they can show excellent student work, it pumps up their enrollment. Uh, so it's a very kind of convenient philosophy for them that. 
oh, you should be really expressive straight away and and to have these ideals that that kind of maybe put out this ex expectation of really great art on on people that just frankly like are not ready for it. I mean, I, I wasn't ready for it. I made I made really bad art, you know, as a student. Like it was awful. <laughs> I mean, especially, you know, when I was studying in the, in the States, like it was, oof. yeah, that stuff, that stuff you'll never see. <laughs> like, I might show you the stuff I did at the Academy, but man, you know, that stuff I did before that was, I mean, basically it was just like Egon Schiele knockoffs, you know, you know, it was just uh, kind of figurative work, but from somebody who didn't know like anything about about figurative work, you know, essentially, which, um, you know, I mean, it is what it is. I'm sure it's maybe has some small charm in some way, but in general, it's of very little artistic merit. Wow, that sounds like really rough. But hey, you know what? I don't know. It's just my feeling about uh, about it. I guess everybody probably looks back on pictures of themselves as a kid and goes. He gets embarrassed or whatever, but certainly I would be embarrassed um, of my the work that I did in in college. Oof, oof, yeah, some of it was rough, not good. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's just my trip down memory lane. Let's see. Neeks is asking: Is it okay to seal graphite drawings with Mod Podge or PVA glue? The fixative I have isn't very good. Uh, or else, what could I do to seal them? Probably, you, you really you would like to use a fixative. I mean, let's be let's be real about it. Um, you want to use a fixative. I use Spectrafix, uh, which is a uh, milk enzyme-based uh, fixative. Uh, originally, it's supposed to be used for pastels, but it works great for graphite drawings, uh, and it's also kind of time-tested in a sense, like it's. You know, people have been using this fixative since like the, the 19th century. It's a company called Spectrafix that makes it. And um, that's the one that I kind of uniformly recommend to uh, uh, to my students. Um, just because I know, like I've tried, like believe me, a lot of different fixatives, you know, and uh, from companies like Talens and uh, Windsor and & Newton and everybody. And I, I'm not going to say the company name, but I'll tell you. There was one that I was using that I straight up like almost ruined a drawing with. Like it left this weird like powdery mist on top of the work. And there was no, I mean, like I couldn't obviously like I can't brush it off of the work because it's freaking done, you know, like it's this finished charcoal drawing. And um, I, I was like, oh, my God, I really like I, I got into a panic because. Uh, it was almost, uh, you know, totally damaged. And I, I had to like go back and like redo stuff about it. You know, I had to go back and like, you know, tickle this edge or do this, this one little thing to, to kind of get, get it to look like it was supposed to. Um, and it was straight up down to the fixative, which is like nightmare stuff. I mean, whatever, it was, it was talent. Talons was the, uh, um, the fixative. Now, you know, whatever, like, you know, if it's a he said, she said, and I'm saying, like, this thing almost damaged my drawing. I'm sure they're going to say, oh, you probably weren't using it right. Listen, I've been drawing for a little while, right? I wasn't using it wrong. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, eventually, like, I, I don't use, that's actually when I started to, when I switched to, like, only using Spectrafix. Because, let me tell you, it only takes you one time for that to happen, for you to be, like, over it completely. <laughs> and uh, I was I was definitely completely over it uh, when when that occurred. Unhappy about it. Right. So let's see what other questions are going on here. Right. Abhinav Bardwaj says I'm 14 and learning by all the content I can find online, but I don't have any teachers, so I'm not able to get critiques. What's your advice on that? The um, getting critiques is like obviously it's super important. Um, so actually, I have a Discord server. So if you are a uh, Patreon subscriber, right, 
And this will get to your question in a second. So if you're a Patreon subscriber, I have a Discord server. And uh, on that Discord server, I have what is called a critique feed. So uh, you can post work there and other people who are engaged in a similar kind of study. And this is the important part. Uh, it's not just getting like random critiques. It's getting critiques from people that are like working on the same kinds of projects as you are working with the same kind of ideals in mind that that you are that's really valuable um and so you can post your work there and get critiques from your your colleagues sometimes i'll drop in and uh, uh you know leave a message or two you know about about the work that's there um, admittedly it's not so often because you know i'm just I, I couldn't do it all the time i'm very busy but um there is a way like to to get access to that uh which by the way yeah if you're a subscriber like you have like like free i mean it doesn't cost you anything extra to be on discord so um you get all the tutorial videos and you get the uh access to di to the discord server as well um and there's some really great uh great great people on there you know like different social platforms you know people kind of like rise to the occasion a bit and there's a lot of people that um that are really really active on discord which is really uh really cool because i think it kind of also like adds a lot of you know value to the experience and and again like i i can't i can i'm busy making videos so like, i can't be doing kind of everything all the time and this is a way that i think the the people that that work with my content can um take advantage of like that most crucial of of features which is like just first like a sense of community but but second like also that that idea of kind of getting uh, proper feedback on the work that that you're making yeah so that's that is the 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 reason that i i went ahead and uh started a discord service i thought maybe that would be a, a great way to yeah just promote that kind of access you know i mean it's what you would have had if you went to a regular uh, uh academy anyway so yeah there you go but i think it's again like it's i think it's totally necessary you know, I mean, um, you can be self-taught, you know, there's a lot of self-taught people out there. Uh, but I think more often than not, in the long run, you're going to want to have, have gotten some like proper practical advice about, about your education. I think it's just natural that way. I don't know if this drawing is coming out. I think it's a little bit too polarized. Like I have my, my values are a little bit too like popping a little bit too hard, you know? Yeah. To like key down some areas. Like for sure the, the white of the eye here is like for sure is too light. Yeah, it goes to show just because it's Photoshop doesn't mean it's going to be a good drawing. I think this one's kind of, I don't know, it has a couple things to it, but it's also like a bit meh. Actually, I actually need to change the opacity on my brush here. All right. Cool. And we're back. Uh, let's see what else is happening. Um, Emmanuel Aliu says, do you feel the younger generation is starting to like classical era drawings again? Like me, I never thought I'd be here until I saw you and other Instagrammers. Yeah, I think that, I think social media, first of all, has probably done a, um, a lot for like representational work. Um, just in terms of like, you know, people respond to, to representational work in a very like natural way like it's like you don't have to manufacture some interest in it or some reason for it to to exist people just like like it they like stuff that looks like stuff they're impressed by it they they find it kind of fascinating the way that someone would do it to begin with you know so there's like a lot of reasons why um you know social media has done a lot for uh for representational work um there really is like something to see you know whereas Maybe a lot of uh, conceptual work, uh, you know, it's more about some explanation of why it's cool rather than just, you know, just tell me what it is. You know, I don't need to hear some big explanation about, you know, why 
John Singer Sargent's portraits are great. Like you can look at them. The evidence is on the surface of them. Um, so did I mean, did I see it? I don't know. I mean, I started uh, on Instagram just as a whim. You know, I remember back in like 2000 and uh, let's go back into history. Back in 2000 and probably 14 or two, probably 2015. Uh, I was just sitting in the office with, I believe it would have been Stephanie Kuhlberg, who uh, who I knew from, she was a student in Sweden. And uh, then, you know, of course, people go and they graduate. I think she teaches actually at the school there now. Uh, but a really cool person, great artist. Um, and she said, oh, you know, you should be, she's a bit younger than I am, yeah, maybe like 10 years or something. She was like, oh, you should be on Instagram. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, well, I don't know. Sure, I, don't, I have an iPhone, so like, what, what the hell? You know, like, I'll, I'll do it. And, um, and so, yeah, like, I just set up an account. Like, that was, that's all, that's all. I was just, I would post stuff every now and again or whatever. Um, flash forward, you know, whatever, however many years later. And now, like, it's my, it's essentially my job. Like, I make, I'm a content creator, you know, I make, tutorials and lessons and the way people find out about them is through social media didn't see that coming um <laughs> i mean yeah like no i totally didn't have any idea by the way like starting out it wasn't like a big concerted effort that now i'm gonna do this and it'll it'll i'll get an audience and then i'll do da 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 you know i'll do all this other stuff it was just kind of like uh yeah i'd been doing it for a while and then it kind of turned into a thing, um, which is usually a good kind of recipe, I think, for for working in this uh, kind of new media, you know, is that, you know, you want to kind of get familiar with the lay of the land like a long time before you um, you need to like do something with it. You know, I think that like starting out on social, you know, with this agenda that I'm going to start out on social and in this amount of time I'm going to be doing dot, dot, dot and uh, I'm going to be successful and so on. You know, may maybe it does work that way. Um, uh, it's, I'm just not familiar with that particular um, trajectory in, in, in working in this in this world. Uh, you know, for me, it was just, it kind of happened a little bit organically, you know, and... Um, so you kind of learn a little bit as you as you go, like what works and what doesn't work. Uh, in the end, like no, it's not. It's not like the hardest thing that that you can do is to, yeah, to 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 work on social media. But um, it does take some it takes a lot of discipline. I mean, you do have to like show up, and I, I think oddly enough, like that's something that I know I know is is a challenge. You know, um, like to literally. I mean, I think in the last. How many years? Probably in the last three years, I don't think there has been a day that has gone by that I have not made an Instagram post. Um, and when I say it, it sounds crazy. But that's how it is. Like, that's what you do if something is your job, you know? Like, uh, and if you're going to be kind of successful at it. So uh, the other thing, too, is that you know, that's difficult for people. That's tough for people to do. And so you realize really quickly that if you can show up, you know, if you can be the one who shows up, that's like half the job is like being there. Uh, and if you can do that, you know, there's a lot of other things that are possible for you as well. Hope that all makes, I'm just rambling at this point. <laughs> I'm like, uh, how long are we in? I don't know. Maybe we're an hour in, two hours in. Um, I've lost track of time completely. We're about an hour and a half in. Uh, let's see. Uh, MJ is asking if I'm still laying in pretty broad at this stage. I would say that everything that I do in digital digital work is pretty broad. So, yeah. Abhishek says, hey, Stephen, how do you how do you be patient enough with what you do? You say yourself to keep going, 
when you're not yet good enough, but people around you are good. In short, what do you do to face your feel of fa fear of failure? Cool question. I mean, basically to face a fear of failure, the thing that you have to do is fail. Uh, and eventually you become a little bit more comfortable with it because you kind of realize that once like you have failed, you realize like, oh, that was it? <laughs> like kind of that's all that happened? I just, I failed and now it's the next day and I can draw again and uh, or paint again. I mean, that's kind of what, what the trajectory of like dealing with failure looked like for me. It was just, you know, you, you hate failing, you want to succeed and then you have a fear of failure and then you fail a bunch, <laughs> a lot, over and over and over and over and over again until you maybe become a little bit numb to it. Uh, and then, then that's when you're productive. <laughs> that sounds like so jaded. But like real talk, I mean, that's how I dealt with failure. Like I just, it happened. Again, I didn't want it to, I didn't try to fail. Um, I tried to make paintings that were good and for many years, like I didn't do that. Uh, and then after a long time doing that, then I started to make some good ones. Uh, and then I started to get like better and better and better and better. And then, I mean, eventually what? You're just a professional and you're working and you're doing your job. So, uh, yeah, that's my best advice. It's just uh, you got to um, you got to get in there and you got to hurt uh, a bit. And uh, over time, that will that will build up a callus. And you will care a little bit less about the failures, which are really like when we're talking about failing. Uh, it's just a learning experience, you know, like uh, I'm not going to say, like, by the way, that this makes failure, like, easy. Like, I'll still pull my hair out, you know, when I'm totally annoyed at having done some stupid thing. Like, I didn't plan this part enough or I, you know, I should have seen that coming or whatever. There's, like, a hundred reasons why, you know, artists can be, like, annoyed at themselves, you know, for some uh, avoidable problem in their, in their work. Uh, but... Yeah, you just eventually like you take those lumps and you you come back eventually and uh, and you're stronger because of it. You know, I think that's probably pretty uniform. I mean, you talk to like anybody that does anything and they're probably going to tell you something pretty similar to that. Um, you want to be a great swimmer? Just get in the freaking pool. You, know, you want to become a, a a great painter? You know what? Get your brush on the canvas and make some bad ones. Um, and uh, I mean, after that, we're just talking about like, well, how do you accelerate it then? Like, how do you optimize? How do you how do you make that time when you're making really bad work shorter, and uh, the time then when you're making better work come sooner? Um, I mean, I think that's if you're a credible online teacher i think that's what you're trying to show people uh is a way that they can they can proceed through their learning uh by making as few um unnecessary trips as possible like that's what i try to do you know on my patreon pages i'm just trying to help people get there faster with a little bit more information uh and and uh a little bit more clarity in terms of like how they understand their their process you know that's what i want to do <laughs> jamie says oh my gosh you're a sports fan i watched the soccer portion on the olympics yesterday uh plays so differently than pro it's true you know like because by the way because i love barcelona naturally like i'll watch the the spanish team and you got this young guy pedri from uh he's like a midfielder from uh, I think he's from the Canary Islands, but um, but he yeah he plays in Catalonia, and he is an absolute baller, uh, a joy to watch. Like I haven't seen, you know, somebody like Pedri since uh, since Iniesta, um, and I'm I've, I'm I'm not alone in saying that. Uh, 
Uh, and if anybody of you know like what I'm saying right now, I would be shocked <laughs> because like I said, nobody, 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 nobody in the world cares about sports. Um, but that I'm saying that Pedri is the, the second coming of Iniesta is a high praise as I think that you can get. Um, great attacking midfielder. Fantastic player. Yeah. And, and you know, one thing too, <laughs> now, that, now that we're on the subject, um, really one of the cool things uh, about, about him as a, as a player, like he's such a, like, maybe this is like my 40-year-old self. Maybe I wouldn't have said this when I was like my 20s, but he's just like a, a get-the-job-done player. Like he's, he's got like the frills and he's like really, he can be like a flash player too. Um, but he's just got those like grinded out skills as well. Like it's not just when everything is going fine that, that he does well, you know what I mean? Like he's, he's the one that like pushes the tempo of the game and it's so, uh, yeah, it's so cool to watch. Also so good to see that in Barcelona because for uh, some years there we were not, uh, we didn't have a midfield that was to the level that it should be. Jose uh, Canizara says, I've watched tutorials by other artists talking about how to become a free thinker and develop my own visual personality after going to art school emulating other artists. How do you go about this? I think that it's uh, influence, right, is something that I think we take in pretty naturally. Like what we're talking about, right, is we're talking about liking stuff. So I like Phil Hale. Right? I think he's a really cool painter. I think that he makes cool work. And you know, I wish my work was cool in a way that was like similar to his. First of all, you got to get comfortable with just saying that because as like a young man, I probably was like, "Oh, I need to be and and also like the way that like American media culture will tell you that you have to be an artist is like you have to be some renegade genius that takes no you know, influence from anybody and, you know, I just, I'm just chasing my own dream or whatever it is. And like, that's fine and cool too. But like as a representational artist, uh, I think it's, it's really quite important to actually look at your, uh, the people that preceded you and understand like your history and your, your place in history. Like all that stuff is very important. Uh, I think to understand like your own importance in your own context. So um, being able to say like, first, I like this this work and I want something about this work. I want my work to reflect that. Like just being able to say that is the start, you know? Um, after that then we can start to say, well, what aspect, you know? And that's when I go to like mood boards and I start looking at trying to analyze like, well, what is it in this work that I actually like? Is it is it everything about the work? Like, do I like everything about Phil Hale? Actually, no, I don't. Like, I actually don't really care a lot for, like, the subject matter always. I think that he's looking at a different kind of psychology than, than is particularly interesting to me. So, so if I'm going to emulate or, or, or to, to grasp something from Phil Hale's work, it's not going to be, um, you know, it's not going to be the stuff that he paints. It's not going to be the, the, the kinds of people that he paints, the kinds of images that he paints. What I find about Phil Hale's work that I love so much is the level of like sophisticated uh, design of shapes is like off the charts, amazing. Uh, and it comes from a place of like dexterity, a place of like facility in his hands. And, you know, actually, I, I actually don't know his work so much from this era, but before he was a, a painter, a painter, like a whatever, you know, fine art painter, whatever we're calling that now. Um, he was a comic artist. Uh, and so, like, a lot of his shapes take a really kind of graphic edge. Uh, and so, like, I discovered, like, that's a big part of what I'm responding to in his work. Um, and I don't know that if I don't, like, kind of go past those first few hurdles of, like, you know, just saying, yes, I like it. Yes, I want a part of it to be my work. Like, what, getting down to, like, well, what is it? What the heck is it about Phil Hale's work that's, uh, so cool that has like such a, a hold or a grip on my um, yeah on my aesthetics, you know that that, that I well I mean I don't know I, I kind of like I mean I I'm not really all that like obsessed about Phil Hale these days I mean it's just a different different place than I want to be but um, at a certain point I would have gone like wow you know Phil Hale was like 
the man. I mean, he still is the man. He's great. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've just moved on to other interesting things, as you will do. Like, you know, I mean, by the way, that's another thing, too. Like, studying academic doesn't mean um, that you're, like, forever an academic or even that, that you even make it to a place where, you know, you could call your work, you know, academic. I mean, uh, yeah. So, th th by the way, there's this, like, stigma around academic training as well which you know some people are not really a subject some people don't really care they kind of get it and they're like i'm not really interested you know in people telling me why i can't do this you know whatever i just want to do it um but there is like uh uh definitely a segment of the um art opinion population where they'll say oh well, ac everything academic is like bland and boring and you can't make interesting academic work because it doesn't work that way well, i don't know I don't know if that's totally true, like just discounting a whole like kind of history of, uh, of painters uh, because maybe they don't reflect, you know, a contemporary taste like at the moment. Um, or even to say that that they're all the same is not I don't I also don't really think that's accurate. Um, but I digress. I'm actually this obviously this whole live stream is a massive digression. So maybe I shouldn't be worried about that. Uh, but yeah, uh, finding your own style. It's just about it's just about understanding your influences, you know, taking them in uh, and trying really to, to understand what and why about them. You know, if, if all you ever do is just like something, you could drink wine for many, many, many years. And you can never, you know, in that time, you know, not really cultivate uh, an ability to taste or, or better appreciate wine. Um, it's by focusing on uh, the questions, having the right kind of vocabulary to describe the experience, like that is how you become like a connoisseur of wine, right? And I mean, in a way, you know, there's an there's an analog here in between, you know, cultivating a taste for for wine or a palate for tasting wine, and and also like kind of cultivating uh, a, a taste for. Uh, for design or a taste for painting or, or a taste for, for many of these different, uh, different elements of, um, of art. So, uh, yeah, that's the primer. That's the beginning of the, of the search. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, more questions coming in. Sorry. You know, with YouTube, like I always have to like scroll back because it jumps forward in the questions. Um, right. Yeah, Vijay Kumar is uh, saying, how do you save or protect your graphite drawings, like fixative or wax paper? Both. Uh, Spectrafix and then uh, some wax paper over the top of that. Um, usually that's enough to, to get them where they, they have to go. Uh, usually I, you can even like ship your artwork, you know, um, like that. So for me, a bit of Spectrafix and... Uh, uh, and then some wax paper over, and I should do, by the way, I have a pretty extensive experience in um, shipping drawings around the world, which drawings, of course, are a little bit, can be a little bit fragile, um, and so kind of getting them from, from A to B uh, can be a little bit of a challenge, uh, but there's some techniques I've developed that I feel like give them a great opportunity to uh, arrive safely, so... Um, yeah, if enough people on Patreon are kind of interested in that, uh, maybe I'll do. Maybe I'll actually put together a video uh, about uh, how to kind of ship drawings. Um, maybe in conjunction with another studio sale. Which, by the way, everybody that uh, collected work, um, wow, that was so that was such a, a cool thing. Like I've been uh, anyway. Whatever. I had a studio sale a while back, and like you know, when you do a studio sale, you just think like. Oh yeah, I'll just you know, I'll put some stuff out, and you know, obviously if some people buy this, great or whatever. I never really tried too much to like sell my own work. I'd always kind of relied on galleries to do it. Um, uh, but I did this this studio sale, and um, it was uh, it was better than any gallery show that I've ever had. Uh, and I think it just goes to show something that I really believe in is that you know, like art is a lot about storytelling, and even even if your art is as essentially, you know, I would say like as simple as mine is, you know, uh, and I, and I don't, I don't think of that as like a, a degradation. I'm not saying like simple is bad. I'm saying that, 
uh, I think simple is uh, you can have a great simple taste. Like one of the great simple combinations of flavors is the caprese salad. Uh, if you um, going back to uh, Florence a little bit, uh, you know, having like mozzarella, bufala and fresh basil and some good tomatoes. Right. It's this triad of um, of flavors that just if you added something to it, it would be a disaster. That's what you want. Maybe a little bit of olive oil and salt. Um, you know, but you don't need to make the caprese salad more complex to be amazing. Um, and so that's how I kind of feel a little bit about my work. I try not to jazz it up too much because I don't, I don't think it needs it, frankly. Like it just needs like a simplicity and a clarity. And I, I think there's something like beautiful about that. But back to storytelling, I'm the one who knows best what my work is about, not some gallerist halfway around the world. Uh, and so, like, I think the the risk of, like, selling your own work is, I don't know, eventually something I, I think that's really good because the people that that are collecting it, they should know what it's about. Like, I mean, that's the reason to own it is to because you know what it's about. And I'm clearly, like, the most qualified person to... Uh, to say, you know, what, what that story is or to say what, what the artwork itself is about. Uh, and I think we kind of lose sight of that sometimes, chasing after, like, the, the gallery dream. Because it sounds really good. Like, it sounds really cool to be, you know, in this gallery or that gallery or whatever. Uh, and, and it can be, for, for sure. But uh, I think, overall, um, if you have an audience yourself, uh, I think there's... I think that both parts of the experience can be improved for the fact that that people are collecting your work like directly from you. That that's been my experience anyway. Right. Um let's see how all of this is going. Um got some more questions. The jeopardy of live drawing, yeah. Um, any tips for self-learning artists? Uh, Sum Yaparna Kirtan is asking. Any tips for self-taught artists? Someone was asking me about this actually the other day and kind of framed the question in an interesting way. Uh, she said, is studying with someone online like the equivalent of like studying with someone? Or like is that kind of still in a way like is that still self-taught? And I never really like looked at that from at that from that perspective because I just, well I mean frankly that people didn't really study with people online as much I mean like to say like what I'm doing right like like the with the atelier tier where I'm like creating uh, this entire curriculum right of of like academic study like I just don't really think that a lot of people were doing that. So the question, I'm not sure if the question ever really came up, like, is that really studying with somebody or is that, are you still like self-taught? Um, I do feel like nowadays we're kind of coming to the place where in certain instances, you know, like you, I'm trying my best to give people as close of an experience as I can to like what I experienced at when I went to school. Um, so I, I would kind of say that like now there are some analogs to, to studying in person. I feel like there's some alternatives. You can say that, yeah, like if you're, if you're following along with all the stuff that I'm doing, I think you can say, yeah, like you're, you're studying with me. Um, and I would say at that point, yeah, maybe you're not really like totally a self-taught artist. Now, obviously, you know, mentorship sessions and like one-on-one -on -one is probably the, the closest way to get to that, but but even so, even just with um, studying the work itself, uh, the tutorials themselves, I think it's still a pretty close way. Um, so tips for somebody w would be to always assess like what kind of work you want to be making and make sure you're studying with somebody for whom that is the kind of work that they make. Uh, someone asked earlier about like, could you study, you know, like the stuff that I do and become a comic artist? That's possible. It's not the straightest line to go from from one to the other. So, like, if you're just thinking about what's optimal, I would say no. You should 
probably try and study with somebody for for whom comics is their primary like mode of expression because obviously they're going to have a lot more to say uh, about the kind of professional angle there. Um, uh, but after that, you know, after you're you're kind of searching out, you know, the 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 kind of like the aesthetic of artwork that that you want to make. Then after that, you, you got to like, you got to take some time with the work. There's something that, you know, um, will probably stop me from ever being a really successful YouTube personality. <laughs> and it is that I, I just, I don't buy the whole tips and tricks culture that, that YouTube is just uh, um, completely saturated with, like where everything is like a tip, five tips for doing your shading, five tips for how to be like an awesome portrait artist. And I mean, I kind of get it. It's like, you can say that there's some things that are like, you could simplify into like a notion and say like, oh, if you do this, like that's helpful. Like maybe I'm giving a tip about how to be like a good student, but it's it's more this idea that like things kind of happen rapidly, uh, and so it sets up. Why do I why does it bother me? Because it sets up people with a totally inaccurate expectation for like what their their educational experience is going to be, right? Like so, if you watch five tips to be a better portrait artist, and then at the end of that you go to make your portrait and you're not a good portrait artist, like you're gonna think like oh there's is there something wrong with me like. Am I, I'm not even able to take the tips and do it, do it right, you know? Um, yeah, so I, I just think it's, it's a weird, I think it's a weird, like, culture thing. Like, I get why it exists, you know? You know, algorithms are judging content based on, like, click rate and things. And if you tell people, hey, here's a big tip, you know, it's going to be easier to get them to to want to click. So I, I understand all of it. I think it's, like, obviously totally fine. I don't want to, like fight the algorithm or change the world or whatever. Um, but it, it's, I mean, it doesn't remind me a lot of certainly the kind of education that I went through to, to try to get good at this stuff. Anyway, I'm off my soapbox now uh, and back to, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's see. Just looking for some questions. Um, Seven Sun says, imagine that happening to a landscape painter like me. No chance to be so popular with landscape painting. People in general resonate much more with figurative art. Yeah, it can be. It can be. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ailey is asking where my Discord link is. Um, you might have to search a little bit through Patreon to find it. Um, but if you are like a subscriber to my Patreon account, then you already have like, um, like it kind of comes with an access. Uh, and that's at any level. So if you're subscribed at $5 or $10 or whatever, um, which by the way, is all it costs to, uh, to subscribe to, to my Patreon. Um, so if you're, um, in the mood for art education and you don't want to spend a whole lot of money to do it, then Patreon is a pretty good place for you to be because, um, it kind of lets me Frankly, like it lets me not have to charge uh, so much for um, for good education. I think it's it's actually like this. It's a kind of a crowd fund in a way, right? Like it's it's people that think something is kind of cool and cumulatively they're like kind of funding the creation. That's how I look at it anyway, because you know there, there's a lot of people that that subscribe there, so that that allows me to like actually commit all of my time. Like it's my job. <laughs> <laughs> to to like make cool tutorial videos um so it's this really like great yeah patreon's an incredible platform I, I just think what they've done for like artists and creatives is it's out of this world because uh before that there was no there was nobody doing for artists and creatives what they're doing for artists and creatives like it just didn't really exist like that um and so that's created like a lot of opportunities actually for for students really like for for people that that want to like learn to to do this stuff those those are the people that that in general also are like benefiting from this uh um 
this kind of panacea, like this new, this totally new phenomenon. Um, so obviously it's been, it's been very good to me. So, so I'm, I'm very positive on it, but uh, I just think in general, like what it's done for, for people like studying online and stuff, crazy, crazy what it's done for. Yeah. Like, where would you, like, where would you get, yeah. Where would you get like that kind of content, um, at that kind of like price? I, I just don't know. I don't even know. Like it used to be like you'd go to a streamline art video or something and be like paying in the hundreds, hundreds of dollars. I'm talking like three, four hundred dollars uh for for lessons, you know? Um and it's because it was uh, this kind of like and that that was by the way, because they, they had to, you know, I mean like the way that they were making videos and the way that they were promoting, like all of it creates this, you know the system where it was like necessary probably to do that. Um, because again, like it's not, it's not really, it's not crowdfunded, you know? Uh, whereas yeah, nowadays it's a little bit of a different, uh, different story. Anyway, I digress further and further and further. Um, let's see what's next. Yeah. So if you're looking for the, um, uh, if you're looking for the discord link, it's somewhere on Patreon. Um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll do another post about it or something or, or, or find a way. But if you're already a patron, you're, you can already be there. There is like a non-patron subscriber section too. Um, eventually I'll, I'll need to like post it, make it totally public. I just wanted to test out the community and kind of see what the vibe was, see if like everybody was into it or not. Um, let's see. <laughs> Dystopia Project says, please, soccer doesn't exist. It's football. That's exactly correct. <laughs> yeah, Seventh Son says uh, that he knows who uh, he or she, uh, I guess he, uh, knows who Iniesta is, thank goodness. And that Pedri is definitely playing too many matches. Uh, yeah, hopefully Barcelona are able to give him like the month off that he needs when he gets back. Yeah. Let's see. Um, sorry, some more questions coming up and I want to kind of give the appropriate respect to him. Yeah, Vibrat is asking about the lower eyelashes, uh, that they're hard to do. Um, they should follow the value, uh, that, that, that the eye has in a sense. So, um, like if you're thinking about like the planes of the eye, uh, let's go ahead and do like another layer here. I'll bring back this one. Wait, uh, sorry. Hold on, folks. Yeah. Um, so just bringing back uh, this layer uh, real quick. And let me get something to uh, draw with. Yeah. So um, basically with, uh, with the eye, um, I mean, every portrait teacher, you know, does some version of this, right? Where you, you can see like the, the upper eyelid shape and the form of the eyeball itself and the lower eyelid shape. Uh, and then it kind of comes down. You have the, the cheek here as well, right? Um, uh, so this is like essentially like what you have uh, with respect to like the, the planes of the eye. Uh, when you're getting the, the light coming from above like this, uh, like the eyelashes here, um, depending upon like how thick they are, how heavy they are in general, they're going to be like a lot of light is going to be passing through them. Um, and also like they, they don't tend to be maybe as thick as the upper eyelids. Uh, so they just need like a much lighter value. If you give them like a really dark value or if like, I guess if your model has like a lot of mascara on or something, um, that can be a little bit more, more difficult or something, but, but in general, they're just a little bit lighter than, than the much thicker eye, um, eyelashes that are on the, the upper eyelid. So, um, yeah, if you just kind of give respect to, to that aspect of it, you should, uh, you should be able to, um, yeah, draw them without, without too much problem. Uh, I think it, usually people will make them a little bit too dark and a little bit too like, is too clear an indication of them, and then that's not uh, really that good of a thing. Let's see. Uh, right. So there's a lot of questions. I actually want to get uh, to uh, um, uh, to all of them. Phyllis Riley says, I'm older, almost 75, and everybody just wants to tell me everything is great when I know it isn't. How can I get them to give me true feedback? 
I think that depends upon who you're getting that feedback from. If it's like feedback from like F and F, like it's friends and family, uh, I think that, you know, show them like either the source image you're working from, show them the, the, the model you're working from and, um, you know, try to try to give them the tools that you have to kind of recognize what, what you're doing. And, uh, um, because a lot of people will have still without necessarily being like artists themselves can have like a, a, a discerning eye, you know, an ability to see when something is, um, is not as good as it should be or, or whatever. Uh, so I think, yeah, just, uh, just help them out a little bit. Um, give them the, the tools that you have to see. Uh, and then maybe you get like a slightly, uh, kind of better response or may maybe you are doing that and, and it's the, it's the same, but <laughs> Uh, you know, you never can tell like what's uh, what's gonna give you the re the result that you're looking for. But that's that's what I would do if I couldn't if I couldn't get like feedback that I thought was like legit. I would try to um, nudge people into a direction that was more to my desired effect. Yeah, because yeah, like in general, like I think you know it it sounds you know Phyllis like you know there's just people there that want to encourage you and want to, um, you know, help you. And the, the way that they, they believe that they can do that in the best way is to, uh, is to encourage. And, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer actually in, you know, critiques that, that encourage. I remember, I remember once, all right, this is like going back to kind of early days teaching, I remember like a conversation I had with a colleague and um, it might have even been like in a teacher's meeting. Uh, and they were saying that, you know, like the hardest thing to do is to give a student that, that critique where it's like, this work is not good. Um, like, so you're like really telling them the, the hard truth. Uh, and this resulted, I think, in a lot of times you know, this, this teacher, like giving people critiques where I feel like at the end of the critique, they went away, like just feeling like, oh, I just, I don't really know what to do. Like it just, my work is bad. Like it's not, it's not good work. And while I do believe that, that there was probably some improvement that, that can come of that, I think actually the more difficult thing to, to actually do is to deliver that kind of critique, but to have that student go away feeling encouraged rather than discouraged. Uh, so I, I don't think it's actually that hard to just look at somebody's work and go like, you know what, it's not good because of this, this, and this. And then like walking away, like I think that's, I think that's kind of easy actually. Like once you get used to critiquing, like, you know, you just say, Da da da. That's that's not good, um, and then go like that's that's pretty simple. But giving somebody the eyes to see that that no, like it's not working right now, but like here's why and here's what actually needs to happen, um, uh, and also to know that by the way, even though that part is going bad, like these other parts are going good. Like I, I also think that like a part of a, a competent critique is going to be. Um, indicating also like what's what's working in the uh in the drawing or painting you know it's not critiquing you know we have naturally this this feeling that it's all about what's wrong uh, it's not only i mean sometimes people have a really hard time seeing what's what's going right in their work and so naturally then a good critique should should include uh, an indication to them of what's uh of what's going well so that's my take on that <laughs> Let's see. Dystopia Project says, even here in France, we call it football and not jus de pied. So you Americans have to call it football too. It's, tr it's true. It's very true. Listen, I don't come over here to Europe saying soccer. Like that's not, that's not the way. In fact, when I go to the States, I have to like switch, I have to code switch a little bit. I have to start saying soccer because if, you, if you're in the States and you're telling people football, like it comes off as a little bit like, who do you think you are? Like, you know, you're an American. <laughs> anyway, uh, Neek says, I want to try using oil primer as I find that gesso is too absorbent. Do I really have to wait up to a year before painting an oil prime surface? 
No, you should probably get an Alkid primer uh, from Gamblin. Dries a lot faster. Um, Vibrant uh, Chaturvedi says, I asked Arthur Gain on Twitch that his portrait looks like yours. He told me he knows you. Arthur Gain. I don't know. I'll have to double check on that. Um, I, pro I mean, you know, we all know each other. I mean, it's a small world, right? Um, Joshua asks, uh, did you learn anatomy or did you just get to know all you do from experience? No, I learned anatomy like pretty, uh, pretty deep, pretty in depth, uh, taught anatomy for a number of years. And, um, uh, I still really love it as a subject, but I don't, um, here's maybe actually a good moment to, uh, uh, to say this, uh, I'm working right. So social media platforms, um, have a particular way that they deal with like nudity and the human figure and those things don't necessarily align with how artists understand you know the importance of the figure uh some accounts are able to do it um my account for whatever reason uh my my account on instagram uh i have uh had what is effectively a shadow ban um, for uh, for nudity in uh, in a figure drawing post that I made. So I do. I mean, like and like I said, you know, this is I do this for a living. So I'm not really going to risk uh, my account um, by 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 doing like kind of nude works on it. But I taught the figure for like whatever, like 15 years almost. And so it's like this massive like knowledge base that I have that I'm not really doing anything with. So what I'm going to do is instead of doing, and by the way, on Patreon as well, like you have the limitation that um, you can be, uh, uh, I think it's like kind of uh, not safe for work or safe for work. Um, like that's the, uh, that's what they're referring to it as, right? It's like you can have a Patreon account that has, contains nudity or doesn't. Now, naturally, if it does, if it does contain nudity, that's what they're saying is that, listen, we're not going to show this to a certain, you know, segment of the population or whatever, um, which is fine. It's totally their right to do it. I don't, you know, I don't want, I want internet security as well for everybody. Um, but that again means like it's a little bit problematic for me to showcase this particular kind of uh, lesson on Patreon. Um, so what I'm going to be doing uh, is actually working on a... Um, a different platform on my own on a, on a website where um, I can kind of advertise that and have that course like on its own um, without it affecting my portraiture courses. Uh, and there's just a, a quirk of social media and how it, it works together with um, admittedly, you know, niche uh, interests, right? Like the, most of the world are not figurative painters. And so for, for them, the consideration is not uh, appreciating the beauty of the human form. It's more like protecting people that don't want to see naked bodies from seeing naked bodies. And I, I totally get and respect that. Um, so, like I said, I'm going to do eventually a, uh, a figure drawing workshop, right? Like an online workshop um, that will be super in-depth. I'm going to go into anatomy. I'm going to go into my, my procedure, like my process of actually studying anatomy, which uh, I developed uh, over many years of, uh, of teaching. Um, and that is going to be, like I said, it's like its own independent thing, separate from Patreon, uh, because it kind of has to be uh, based on these, um, these guidelines, which I understand and respect, not complaining, uh, but just setting out the kind of lay of the land so everybody knows like why, why I'm doing things in a certain way, I guess. Let's see. Um, <laughs> a lot of people pumped about the hat. This is uh, from uh, it's a company called, I think, Gorin, G-O-O-R-I-N, Brothers, in the UK. <laughs> Let's see. All right. Well, there's a lot of questions. I think probably we've been in a couple hours, so probably I got I to gotta cut, um, cut this short. Yeah, actually, why don't we why don't we just wrap it up here and um, thank you everybody like so much for like all the comments and stuff and like all the uh, uh, the cool input and for listening to me talk about soccer for a minute even though like I know 
for 98% of you, that's like a huge bummer. <laughs> so I appreciate you uh, uh, hearing me out there. And also, let's not forget Patrick Burns. The guy's amazing. He works really fast. He's really prolific, really well-educated and communicates his thoughts really, really well. Like the, the people that I've chosen to work with, like Patrick and, and eventually Adal, um, these are people that, that are so excellent at what they're doing. Uh, and I just thought, God, I've got all this equipment, all this camera equipment, this know-how about producing videos. Like I should just be, I should be producing videos with them. So, so this is like going to be the first one of those on August 1st, it's available on my Patreon page. Uh, and then for only two months, so August and September, it will be available for those of you that are going to work along with it, right? Get your cans and meats on paper, your graphite pencils and your white chalk ready because on August 20th, there's going to be a due date to turn in your submissions on my Patreon page, right? So you're going to post them on the community section. And then on the 21st, I'm going to do a group critique of all the drawings that have come out of that lesson with Patrick. So I'll see you all there. Uh, take it easy. And thanks so much for your, uh, your time. Wait a minute. All right, now I'm out of here. <laughs> see you guys around.